All right, well, we are going to take a break from Daniel. It breaks my heart to take a break from Daniel. But uh, we are going to take a break from Daniel. We'll talk about Daniel a little bit today in our message. Uh, but we're going to focus, as Steve's prayer this morning was on, on uh, Christ riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. That's what we're going to focus on today. And next week, uh, Resurrection Sunday, certainly that our Savior is risen, just like Joyce sang today. He is alive. So I'd like you to turn in your Bibles with me this morning to Luke chapter 19. If you've been here for any length of time, if you've been here the last three or four years, i got to tell you something. I'm going to give you just a little hint. I've preached out of this text for the last three or four years on Palm Sunday. Somebody told me, well, you should have it down pat by now, shouldn't you? I don't know about that. But uh, we're going we're gonna to look through Luke chapter 19 this morning, beginning in verse 28 through verse 44. The title of the message is this, If Thou Hast Known the Time. If you had only known the time. This passage of Scripture is coming off of the parable in chapter, beginning of chapter 19 of Zacchaeus. And then also uh, the parable of those who, who would not receive the Master who was returning home. And so Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 28, here comes Jesus. And he says, And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. Well, that's absolutely accurate, ascending up to Jerusalem. It was 20 miles from Jericho to Jerusalem, 20 miles. And that was the trip that he was making. So 20-mile trip. And they went from eight and Jericho, they went from 800 feet below sea level to 2,500 feet above sea level in Jerusalem. So in less than 20 miles, they covered 3,300 feet. It's pretty amazing. So it's accurate here. He was ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples saying, Go ye into the village over against you in the which at your entering you shall find a colt tied. This is important for us. Whereon yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. Bring him to me. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall ye say unto them, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were, went, they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. That's important. Verse 32 is very important. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now, at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice. And that's important. The whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. And here's what they were rejoicing. Here's what they were praising with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And then some of the Pharisees, and they always ruin everything, the Pharisees. And some of the Pharisees among, uh, from among the multitude said unto him, Master, that's the word rabbi, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and he said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, if the disciples would keep their mouths quiet, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld, he took in the city, he considered the city, and he wept over it. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to elaborate a lot on this, but I want you to know, this is not a picture of Jesus standing, looking out over the city of Jerusalem with a tear running down his cheek. Take and look up this phrase in the Greek, in its original language, and look what it means when it says that as he was come near, he beheld the city. He considered the city and he wept over it. He convulsed over it. He sobbed out loud. He was bawling. 
That's the picture. And that's the picture we should have. And he's saying this, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thy eyes, for the days shall come upon thee. And it's going to be 38 years later. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side. Titus Vespasian is going to come in almost 40 years later. He's going to dig a trench the whole way around the city wall of Jerusalem. He's going to put up an embankment and he's going to trap them in and he's going to destroy the city. And verse 44 says, And shall and shall lay thee, you are going to lay, even with the ground, and your children within you, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. Why? Here's the title of the message. Why? Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Palm Sunday. Steve's prayer this morning regarding Palm Sunday. That's the day that we celebrate today. Palm Sunday. It's the day when Jesus publicly makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now, I believe that in Revelation chapter 19, when Jesus returns with the armies of heaven, and he's on a white horse, and he's, he's descending from heaven, from glory, with the armies. That's you and I, by the way. I believe that's the triumphal entry. We've called this the triumphal entry. But in Revelation 19, he's going to be descending on a white horse. Here, he's descending, he's ascending on a donkey. Now, this is just like Jesus. In the story, when he turned the, 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 the water into wine, he saved the best for last. Well, I believe he's saving the best for last here, too. Saving the best for last. All four Gospels give us this picture of Palm Sunday. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all describe Palm Sunday. Every one of them describe Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And it's interesting, if you read every one of their accounts, they're just a little bit different. And I believe that's by design. The crowds that were gathered around Jesus as he was coming off the Mount of Olives, as he was descending the Mount of Olives, but ascending to Jerusalem, the crowds that gathered around him had very different views as well. They had very different expectations from the purposes of heaven that were unfolding before their eyes. There were those who were there who thought that he would deliver them from Roman rule. There were those who were there that thought he was there to set up his kingdom. There were those that were there who were looking for a political, who were looking for an earthly thing to take place. And that's very far from what's taken place. That's very far from what's happening to the point that Jesus is looking out over Jerusalem and he is convulsing, he is crying, he is sobbing because of their blindness. And I don't, and, and I personally believe that his vision didn't just encompass the city of Jerusalem. I believe he was able to see all throughout history the blindness of mankind. Heaven's plan is unfolding right in front of their eyes. Heaven's plan, what God had ordained before the foundation of the world, was unfolding right before their eyes. And now for the very first time, for the very first time in the Gospels, Jesus is orchestrating. Jesus is moving. He's orchestrating everything that takes place. If you look back in Luke chapter 9, just keep your finger in our text, but look at Luke 9 and look at verse 51. I want to show you this because this gives us a picture of, of, of what is happening in the life of Jesus in his mind, in his heart, 
Father, he says, if this possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, my will, but thine be done. And see, he says that a few days later, after his triumphal entry. But this is his heart, verse 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. Look what he did. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And for the first time in the Gospels, he is orchestrating everything that takes place. Up until this point in Jesus' ministry, up until, uh, up until Luke chapter 9, verse 51, up until that point in Jesus' ministry, whenever, whenever he, whenever he uh, 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 healed the blind man, here's what he said. Look, don't tell anybody. Don't tell, go to the, go, go to the temple, go offer sacrifices, do all that, but don't tell a soul. Don't tell one person. When he healed Jairus' daughter, he said, Jairus, go home, take care of her, but don't tell anyone. Don't tell them. When he fed the 5,000, <laughs> he fed the 5,000 with just a little bit of stuff. And what they wanted to do, they wanted to, they wanted to rustle him away and, 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 and snatch him up and make him a king. And he wanted nothing to do with that. And then on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, and, and Jesus, and Moses, and Elijah appeared, you know, the disciples there. Peter's like, oh, oh, Messiah is come, Messiah is come. Because the Bible says that Elijah, and I think it's Malachi, the Bible says Elijah shall come first. And, and so Peter's like, the Messiah's come. You know, and on the way down the mount, Jesus is like, hey guys, shh, just keep that quiet. Because you really don't know what's going on. Just keep it quiet. Don't tell anyone. But the point is that up until Luke chapter 9, verse 51, Jesus kept putting this off. Because it wasn't his time yet. He kept putting this off, look, until this day, the day we're reading about right now, until this day. What's different about this day? What's so important about this day? In all four Gospels, Matthew and Mark say this, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There's a difference. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a messianic introduction. Luke says, blessed be the king who comes in the name of the Lord. John says, blessed be the king of Israel. That's what John says. But all four gospels ascribe to him this messianic introduction out of Psalm 118. All four gospels. To the point where the religious leaders say, make them stop, they're calling you the Messiah. Make them stop this. Don't do this. But you have to understand what's going on this day. It's Palm Sunday. But what is the environment like? What is, what is the surrounding? What's, what's taking place? There are, this is a mandatory feast. There are three mandatory feasts for the nation of the Jews. Three. This is one of them. And so Jerusalem, at this time, has swelled from about 600,000 people on a normal day to roughly 2.5 million. Can you imagine that? Todd going from 11 people to 100. That would be amazing. That only happens on Sunday mornings around here. <clears throat> Actually, 200. 600,000 people to 2.5 million people were camped everywhere. There were crowds everywhere. Look at verse 37 in our text. Look at what it says. And when he was come nigh, even now to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. The disciples are gathered with him, a whole multitude, because of the things that they had seen, the works that they saw. There's no doubt in my mind, blind Bartimaeus is here. Zacchaeus is probably here. Simon, who, <clears throat> who was once a leper, is probably here. Lazarus, who was, raised, who was dead and raised from the dead, is probably here. The whole crew is here. Now look at John's gospel, and look at John chapter 12, and look at verse 17 and verse 18. 
It says, the people, therefore, that was with him, that was with Jesus, when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him up from the dead, they were there. They're bearing record to this too. They were there. Look at verse 18. And for this cause, the people also met him. For they had heard that he had done this miracle. So this, this huge crowd, this, this huge, look, it's not 12 guys. This is a multitude. This is masses of people. And here's what they're doing in our text in verse 38. They are shouting, verse 38, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And Matthew in John's gospel says that there was a crowd also that was coming out of the city to meet him. Not only was there a mob following him, but there was a mob coming to meet him. Now that's pretty neat. Now flip back in Matthew's gospel because I want to show you one word. In Matthew chapter 21, Matthew's account of this, Matthew chapter 21 and verse 10. It says, and when he was come into Jerusalem, this is Matthew's account of Palm Sunday, and when he was come into Jerusalem, look here, all the city, listen, 600,000 people to roughly 2.5 million people. It says all the city was what? Moved, saying, who is this? Move, that word moved in the Greek Seismos. It's where we get our English words seismograph. Huh. Seismograph. It means to be shaken. The whole city was shaken. All of Jerusalem is shaken to its core. They have never, ever seen anything like this. One man, one person. Multitudes crying out. Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And the Romans are going, you got to be kidding me. He's not a king. He's not on a white stallion. He's not coming in in royalty. He's on a donkey. Stop. The religious leaders, they don't get it. Make them stop. The disciples, they don't get it. They're still fighting over who's going to sit on his left hand, who's going to sit on his right hand. The only one besides Jesus Christ who got it was the donkey. We'll get there. I told Pastor Matt that this morning in the office. I said, you want me to tell you, Matt? He says, no, no, I want to leave it for the sermon. Leave it, please, leave it for the sermon. But what about this day? What about this day? Why this day? Why was this day set apart? Why? Look. Go back to Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Why was this day? What is it about this day? Why was this day set apart five to six hundred years before this ever took place? Look what Zechariah in chapter 9, verse 9, had to say about it. He says, rejoice greatly. Listen, that's what they were doing. All four Gospels say that's exactly what they were doing. O daughter of Zion, shout. All four Gospels say that's what they were doing. O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation. That's what they missed lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Five to six hundred years before this happens, Zechariah describes this scene in one verse to a T, doesn't he? To a T. When the children of Israel would come up to Jerusalem for the feast, all three mandatory feasts, when they would come up, they would sing from Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. They would sing those, they're called the songs of ascent, and they would sing them. 
as they come together. But in Psalm chapter 118, I want to show you this. Go back to Psalm 118 and look at verse 22 to verse 29. I want you to see what was taking place with the people on this day as written in the Old Testament. Psalm 118, verse 22, it says, The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is what they are singing, folks. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Now look here at verse 24. This is the day. Palm Sunday. This is the day. We say this. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We should rejoice and be glad in it. Palm Sunday. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Look here, verse 26. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. All four gospels said that they were shouting this. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. Verse 27 is very interesting. God is the light which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords even unto the horns of the altar. This is what the this, this is the light that they lacked at that time. The sacrifice was coming, Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about. Verse 28 says, Thou art my God, I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. They were singing this, and he was arm lengths away from them, and they missed it. They missed it. But the prophets spoke so clearly and so precisely. And Jesus says in verse 42 of our text, If thou hadst known, if you had only known, even thou, at least in this thy day, verse 44 says, Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. The psalmist says, This is the day. Zechariah says in Zechariah 9.9, you need to take note of this. Folks, you know this. There are two things that I believe sets Christianity apart from every other religion in the world. Two things that sets us apart. Two things that, that causes us to be different. Why, why we are different from every other religion. The first thing is this, that in Jerusalem, there is an empty tomb. That's enough. That's enough. There's an empty tomb in Jerusalem. And you should be doing cartwheels. Because if Jesus' tomb is not empty, we're done. In Jerusalem, there is an empty tomb. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He is alive, and that sets us apart from every other religion in the world. The second thing that sets us apart from every other religion in the world, every other, every other holy book, our holy book, our, the Word of God is greater than one-third predictive or prophecy. Do you know that? I'm really convinced that you know that. It is greater than one-third predictive. It is greater than one-third prophecy. And we forget that. When we've been around something for a long time, it becomes not so important to us. It needs to be important to us. Because there is way more prophecy in the Bible about the Lord's second coming than there ever was His first coming. And if you look at the world today that we live in, it's evident that Jesus is coming soon. It's evident. And if you don't see that, it's because your head's in the sand. He is orchestrating the nations of the world. He is arranging things and putting them in the right places right now. Just like he did on Palm Sunday. 
when he said to those two disciples, hey, you go over there, you'll find a colt. It'll be with, Matthew's gospel says, it'll be with its mother. Luke doesn't say that, but Matthew's gospel says that. It'll be tied. They found him tied. It'll be at a place where two roads intersect, where two roads meet. Guess where it was? Right at a place where two roads meet. He said, I want you to untie the colt and take it. And if somebody asks you why you unloose the colt, tell him that the Lord hath need of him. Well, that happened. Everything was arranged. Everything was in order. Jesus, who pulled away up until this point in, in public recognition on this day, is arranging everything for him to be received and recognized publicly. That's what's happening. He's arranging everything in our day right now for his second coming, when he comes on a white horse, when he comes with his vesture dipped in blood, and he comes as the king of kings, riding on a horse, not on a donkey. And he's coming with the armies of heaven. And there is, there is more prophecy, there is more evidence about this day that we live in right now than there was when he came into Jerusalem. Man, and you better get excited about that. Now I want to show you, go back to Isaiah. I want to show you some things. Isaiah chapter 41. This is in regards to prophecy. Isaiah 41 verse 4. Now we've been through these scriptures before. <clears throat> you should be somewhat familiar with them. But look what he says. Who hath wrought, who hath made it and done it? Calling the, this is God speaking, calling the generations from the beginning. Who, who's done that? Well, the Lord has. Jehovah, Yahweh, I, the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am He. Look at verse 21 to verse 23. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the King of Jacob. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Isaiah is challenging those uh, who chase after idols instead of God. Let them bring forth, let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things, what they be, that we may consider them, speaking of the idols in Israel, and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are God. Yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed or behold it altogether. Look at chapter 42 and look at verse 8 and verse 9. God says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare before they spring forth. I tell you of them. Look in chapter 44 and look at verse 7. And who as I shall call and declare and shall declare it and set it in order for me since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come. Let them show unto them. Look at chapter 46, last one, verse 9 and verse 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. What is the importance of prophecy? Because this is all prophetic. What is the importance of it? God says prophecy reveals that I am who I say I am. That's what prophecy says. That's the importance of prophecy. God says when I say it, it happens just like I say it. Who else can stand outside of time and tell you things that are coming and have them happen exactly as they say they are. No one. That's right, Jim. In the Old Testament, it says if someone comes to you and says they're a prophet or they're a prophetess and they, and they, and they make prophecy or they predict something and it doesn't happen exactly as they say it happened, God says, I didn't send them. They didn't come for me. 
take them out and stone them. And that doesn't mean just go hit them in the head with a rock. That means kill them. Because I did not send them. I did not send them. Because when I say it, it's going to happen. Today we have all these phonies. We have this, what is it, uh, Long Island Medium and, and, and Nostradamus and the Psychic Hotline and all that stuff today. That's baloney. That's garbage. It's nonsense. There was an article, and I know I shared this with you before I had to, but there was an article in the Florida paper that said about the Psychic Hotline of Florida. It said the Psychic Hotline, it said, uh, was going, went bankrupt. And it said underneath it, the subtitle said, they never saw it coming. But I want you to know that Christ saw it coming. Christ saw it coming. He's laid it out. He's laid it out in, in the events of this day. Why is this day so important? Daniel was in Babylon, and we read this scripture last week. Daniel was in Babylon, and he begins to read, and we didn't get there yet. It's in chapter 9, but Daniel begins to read from the prophet Jeremiah. Daniel learned a lot from Jeremiah. But he began to read from the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29.10. And it said, where it says, 70 years I will bring my people back from captivity. Daniel said that when he realized that they had reached the 70-year period in Babylon, he began to pray. He began to pray. And then, and then the angel Gabriel came and said unto Daniel and said, Hey, Daniel, there are 70, Daniel, there are 70 sevens determined for the rest of all of Israel's prophetic history. 70, not 77, there are 70 sevens. Today, we have decades, which are 10-year periods, not seven-year periods. We have 10-year periods. They're called decades. We use, it's a Roman measure. So if somebody says it was 70 decades, that's 700. Said to Daniel, there are 70 sevens. There are 70 heptads. A seven-year period is a heptad. Seventy sevens. The Jews had that. Heptads. That's 490 years. So there's a 490-year period set aside for all prophecy to be fulfilled in regards to Jerusalem and, and the children of Israel and to bring in righteousness. And Daniel said, or Gabriel said to Daniel, Look back in Daniel chapter 9. I want to show you this. In, in Daniel chapter 9, in verse 25 and in verse 26. Gabriel said this. Now therefore, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. That happened. Unto the Messiah. From that time, the Messiah is coming to seven to restore the creatures. Seven weeks and three score in two weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous time. And after three score and two weeks, after 483 years, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And I people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood unto the end of the war. Desolations are determined. So Gabriel sends, says to Daniel, Daniel, there are 483 years. I'm not going to read this. I know I have it on the screen this morning. I'm not going to read it. But in, in Nehemiah chapter 2, in the first six verses, the command, Artaxerxes, the command, he gave the command to Nehemiah to rebuild the city, to rebuild Jerusalem. The command was given to rebuild the city walls, not the temple. Ezra built the temple. But Artaxerxes gave the command to Nehemiah in, in Nehemiah chapter 2 in the first six verses to rebuild Jerusalem and the city walls. And it says that in, in the 20th year of his reign. Well, we know 
that that, and it gives the days. We know that that date was, was, that was the first day of the month in the spring. And here was the date. It was March the 14th, 445 B.C. So from March the 14th, 445 B.C., you add 483 years to that. Where does that take you? There's a few things we need to figure out first. They didn't operate in 365-day years. They operated in 360-day years. So do this in your head real fast. 360 days times 483. Come on, how many? How many? It's 173,880 days. Gosh, it's real simple, guys. It's 173,880 days. You mess with leap year in there, and you take the year that goes from B.C. to A.D., and you figure all that out. And you take March the 14th, 445 B.C., Daniel says, add 483 years to that, and that's when Messiah will come. So you add 173,880 days to that. It comes out to April the 6th, 32 A.D., Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And Jesus says, if you had only known this thy day. If you had only known this thy day. The day that he would ride into Jerusalem as the Lamb of God. And everyone needs to see this. is accurate and is precise and as much as spoken about this day. Listen, there is more spoken about prophetically about the days we live in. We need to go where he wants us to go. We need to do what he wants us to do. And we need to lift him up before men. And the Bible says this, Jesus says this, he says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. How is it with you this morning? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you been redeemed? Have you received his free gift of salvation? The redemption has been paid for. All you have to do is receive it. And if you are redeemed, there's a lot of junk in our life that keeps us tied up. We need to be released. We need to be released. And then we need to be ruled. God, not my will, but thine be done. Would you stand with me this morning? God, your good Father. And that you are. You're our Heavenly Father. You love us so much. Pastor Matt shared in his message last night at the basketball assembly about how much God loves us. I believe if, if God didn't love us, he wouldn't care what we did. But he died for us. He died for the sins of the world. When he went to Calvary's cross, he went there in my place and in your place. He went there instead of me. He went there as me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for paying the ultimate price so that I don't have to pay for it. There's one here today watching live by way of the internet or one here today who doesn't know you as Savior. Maybe today is the day that you break down their walls. Maybe, the day is, maybe today is the day that you show up at their party uninvited and you say, look, I love you. I know, I know what's going on in your life is difficult. I know the problems you have. I know there's nothing about you that escapes me. I know, I know the number of hairs on your head. I knew your days. In fact, I laid them out before you were even formed in your mother's womb. I know everything about you, child. 
But I need to know, do you know that today is the day? Do you know that today is the day that I am drawing you to myself? Lord, and maybe they'll run to you. Say, Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you. I can't do this on my own any longer. I, I don't want to try to do this any longer because my plan is failing and it always fails and I always end back and up in the same place. Lord, save me a sinner. And what's so great about that heartfelt prayer is that the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If there are Christians here today that are redeemed, but they're not released and they're not being ruled. Maybe today is a day that you'll drive them off of that post, that you'll set them free today and they'll surrender your life and say, Lord, rule my life, rule and reign in me. And Lord, help me to lift you up before all men. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us today. Thank you for this special Sunday morning, Palm Sunday as we gather together as the bride of Christ. If there's anyone here that has a need today, I don't care what it is, Lord, and you, do, you don't care what it is either, I pray that you just drive them to yourself. Draw them and drive them to yourself. And they would not care what people think around them, behind them, in front of them, or next to them, but the only voice that matters is your voice in their life. And they can come today and meet you right here at this altar. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.